the glory of your name, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, and as you're seated, turn in your copy of God's Word to the book of Matthew, and we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 4 today, uh, Matthew 4, starting in verse 12 and going through verse 17. We are uh, studying through this book, uh, just verse by verse, section by section, and, and seeing who Jesus is, seeing what Jesus did, uh, that we would be uh, more fully devoted followers of Jesus, right? And so I just find it amazing to look at his life and to consider um, who he is and what he did. So again, Matthew chapter 4 will be in verses 12 through 17. I did receive word that Christopher Dale had a family emergency. He won't be here today, but if you'd like to help with our Thanksgiving Day ministry, I'd sign up online. He won't be out in the foyer today, uh, but you can sign up online if you want to help with that. All right, Matthew 4, verses 12 through 17. This is the word of the Lord. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we need the healing of your word. Father, we need the restoration of your word. We need the direction of your word. And so, Father, send your Holy Spirit upon us all as we gather around your word, as I speak it, as we, as others listen, Father, that you, that the Spirit would speak to us through it, Father, directing us in the way that we ought to live and believe, Father, that we may bring you honor and glory as individuals and as a church. Father, we ask your help in this, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we get to uh, this point in Jesus' life, he starts us off by helping us to see the big picture. And Matthew records this. Now, if, um, if we have a political candidate and we're wondering, hey, what is that political candidate going to stand for? We might look for those first words at the beginning of their campaign that tell us, I am so-and-so and this is what I stand for. Maybe you've read a book or um, a book and you've said, well, this book's interesting to me. Interesting. What is it about? You might read the title. You might read something on the cover. What the cover is going to tell you, it's going to say, this book is about this and that. And then the rest of the book is explaining what this and that were. Well, when we get to uh, Matthew 4.17, we see the big picture of what Jesus is going to be doing and ministering in his life. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. These are the exact same words if you, that John the Baptist used. If you jump back to Matthew 3.1, you see John the Baptist said the same exact words. But by the time we get here, we're even closer, right? The kingdom of heaven was at hand with John the Baptist. And what he's saying is look for it. But when Jesus says it, he also says it's a hand. But it's just even a little bit closer by the time that we get here. Uh, there's been some... Um, changes from when we saw it, Matthew 3, 1. After that point, uh, Jesus was ordained in his baptism. He was filled in the Holy Spirit. He had been uh, tempted inside of the wilderness. And now was the time for him to start his public ministry. And we see his words. First, a call to repent. And secondly, a call to believe. To turn towards the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom in which Jesus is bringing. And in this, he is telling his followers, just as he's telling us today, that we need to stop letting the kingdom of this world run our lives and instead put our agenda, put our life in line with the kingdom of heaven. We certainly have a uh, temptation in this life to live uh, for this world as if it is the ultimate kingdom. Um, And what Jesus is reminding us, it's not the ultimate kingdom. 
and we need to turn away from it. So one of the things that I want to work through today is this idea of a kingdom, because kingdom and kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, uh, they're synonymous terms, uh, you know, but what are they, you know, what, is, what does this mean? Because even if I were to ask you today, well, what does the kingdom of heaven mean? Uh, your, your eyes may glaze over and you think, you know what, I mean, I kind of know, but it's kind of hard for me to explain. Well, one of the reasons I wanted to take a whole sermon on this little section was because it's challenging for me to know and explain as well. And so the fun of it was just working through to explain it, hopefully, in a clear and understandable way. And we talk about a kingdom, we might think of the rules of a nation, the laws of a nation. Every uh, nation or every um, kingdom is going to have its laws and its rules. And just for fun, I looked at some of, I looked up some of the strangest laws that happen in America, and I thought I would share some of those strange laws with you. The first one's a doozy, and it's this one. In the state of Arizona, there is a law that forbids putting donkeys in bathtubs, at least after 7 p.m. And you might think, why is there a law against donkeys in bathtubs? It's because once there was a donkey that was in a bathtub and he fell asleep and it clogged up, supposedly it clogged the drain or something, and, the, and it so overflowed that the donkey ended up going down the river and hundreds of people had to go save this donkey. And in order to prevent that from ever happening again, they made a law, no donkeys in bathtubs after 7 p.m. Some of you may have had trick-or-treaters at your door at your door sometime this week, and you wondered, uh, well, how old is too old to be trick-or-treating? And um, you might have known that. You might have looked at kids and said, you're too old to be here. Well, if you live in Chesapeake City, Virginia, uh, there is a law that you cannot trick-or-treat if you're over 14 years of age or older, right? All right, so, uh, all right, here's one in Vermont women must get written permission from their husbands if they want to get false teeth. It's, now, that's an unenforced law, I guess, but I guess it's still on the books. And in, in Kansas, it is illegal to serve ice cream on cherry pie. Now, it's unclear why that came to be, and they say it's not enforced, and it might have even been secretly erased, but, uh, but they don't have any record of that. Now here's one, before any of you think of men, before any of you men think about moving your family to Samoa, I want to give you this warning that it is illegal in Samoa to forget your wife's birthday. So you might want to double think of that before you ever move there. Well, you know, nations have their laws, and you know, that's one way that we might understand. They have their laws, they have citizenship, they have things that are connected up with that. And to be part of a nation is to be part of that nation's system of governments, is to be, come under that constitution, is to come under that, um, that, that, that rule that is there. And Jesus is pointing us to another kingdom, a greater kingdom, a better kingdom, with, with a rule which has been set forth in his word. And what he points to in this is that his kingdom is good, that it is a greater kingdom than the kingdom that exists in the world. We need to repent and sort of looking to make this kingdom our home and look instead to his, right? So this is an important concept. Um, let's, let's look at our passage here today, one of those 50 times in the book of Matthew that the kingdom is named, um, is, is described. So one of the first things we see in verse 12 is that Jesus was committed to making his kingdom known. Uh, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. That's the thing that we, that, that we read there. Now, somewhere between verse 11 and verse 12, um, a lot had happened inside of Jesus' life. You know, we don't see it here. And Matthew says that's not important to the story. I'm going to tell you about Matthew. But if you were to go read John verses, uh, John chapter 1 through 5. I mean, all of chapter 1 through 5 happens between verse 11 and 12. And a lot of what happens in John 1 through 5 is Jesus goes to Jerusalem. Jesus is in Nazareth. Jesus is traveling in other parts. And he's doing miracles. And, and he's, he's, he's doing some more quiet work um, with individuals throughout that whole process as he, as he ramps up up to this big time where his public ministry is going to begin. Matthew's really focused on the beginning of his public ministry in Matthew 4, 12. Um, and what does he have to do? As we see here, he has to leave those other travels that he has down the south and he moves up then into northern Israel to the place of Galilee. John the Baptist, we see, had been arrested. Uh, he had confronted political leaders. He'd confronted spiritual leaders and it became too much for them. And in a time of their own persecution 
of, of the Church of Christ, they end up throwing him in jail. You know, just again, remember, today is the day of prayer for the persecuted church. And to think through persecuted believers, you may know, we have Zagros mentioned in the bulletin. Good to pray for him today as a specific outcome of that. So, um, and so here's Jesus, his, his cousin and, uh, has been arrested, and he has the same message as John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's going to pick up where John the Baptist had left off. Uh, so he's going to appoint apostles. He's going to begin this public ministry. Uh, he's eventually going to go to the cross, and he's not going to go there too early. And so that's why he does this retreat. He's, you know, up to the northern um, territory of Israel where he's not going to garner so much attention and he can build um, this work ultimately till the day he goes to the cross. He, he's been growing in popularity, but there was still work to do. And in order to not draw and do attention to himself, to avoid arrest, that's why he makes withdrawal. And it's a good reminder to us that there are times where we need to make strategic retreats to, rem to remove ourselves from points of controversy, places of persecution, so that we can faithfully minister the gospel uh, where we are, maybe in a new place. Um, you know, again, many believers across the world being persecuted have to retreat um, into other places to go into hiding that they would not be um, hurt. It's not unfaithfulness to do that. Um, it, but it's a matter of judgment when to do that as Christians. Um, when to do in our culture, when to do in our personal lives. Retreat does not always mean failure. When we do it to trust God, when we're doing to uh, re-energize for the mission that's ahead, to, to learn in prayer, to trust in God, um, you know, those things can be a right and good action. We don't have to hit every challenge that's before us. And we see Jesus doing that as well. Something else we see uh, with this account is we see how Jesus fulfills ancient prophecies. We see that especially in verses 13 through 16. Um, says this, and leaving Nazareth, he went to live in Capernaum by the sea, the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that it was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee, the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. For those living in the region in the shadow of death, on them light has dawned. So this is a prophecy which comes out of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Again, a reminder to us that Jesus fulfilled so many Old Testament prophecies um, during his life as recorded in the New Testament. You know, it's one of the pictures. How do we know Jesus was the Son of God? How do we know he was the Savior who was to come? You know, one of the great evidences is all these prophecies in the Old Testament uh, came, were fulfilled in his life. Even where he started his ministry in this northern part of, of Israel. This was a section in uh, Israel which was never able entirely to be conquered. Uh, from the start of their nation throughout its history, there were many people who held to different religions. They were from different nations, and uh, they didn't know God. And as God says that this is going to start here, it's a picture to uh, the church, to us today even, to say that God is interested in the nations coming to faith in Jesus Christ. This is a worldwide work of many nations coming to faith. Another thing we see is the hope that Jesus brings. Uh, we see in verse 16 that the people have lived in darkness. Now they're seeing a great light. They're living in the shadow of death, but on them a light has dawned. You know, all the different religions that are part of this, the paganism that's there, it was a superstitious place. It was a dark and oppressed place. They were further from the temple of God. They were less influenced by the law of God. Um, and as a result, this is very spiritually dark. And it worked out in the lives of people there. And that's exactly where God planted Jesus, was to bring light into that dark place. It's a reminder to us that the, the darker that a place is, the brighter that the light shines. And Jesus was light of the world to bring light there. And his first message then is to repent. It's a general message to every single person there. There is nobody who is exempt from this call to repent. By nature, we are part of another kingdom until God renews us, regenerates us, and brings us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And so his call is to everyone there, just as it is a call to us today who hear that message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Another thing that we see is that Jesus brought his kingdom, and then to follow him is to enter into his kingdom. That's one I want to expand on a little bit more, is that Jesus brought his kingdom, his kingdom was at hand, and then to follow him 
is to enter into that kingdom. If I were to say, where is the kingdom of heaven? It's located most simply in Jesus Christ. The kingdom is located most simply in Christ. It's not a geographic place that we can see on a map. It's not a political party. In fact, before his crucifixion, Jesus said that his kingdom was not of this world. But where is it? It is in Jesus Christ. And as he is our Lord and our Savior, we become part of his kingdom. Right? So there's three things we want to talk about. We look at this kingdom. The first thing, number one in your outline today, the kingdom is living in covenant relationship with God in Jesus Christ. The kingdom is living in covenant relationship with God in Jesus Christ. Now, when we think about an earthly kingdom, a worldly kingdom, the most simple explanation of it is that a kingdom exists where people are under the authority of a king. That's really simple. It's where people are under the authority of the king, even Though the United States is not a kingdom, we might think of it in terms of that. There are places in this world where um, the, 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 you know, the laws of the United States are in effect. There are places um, in a world where the promises and the benefits of citizenship are in effect. And then there are other places where, where, where it isn't in effect. And, you know, if there are, are places where they don't, they're not under the authority of that king, they don't recognize uh, the king's rule, it's hard to play, call those places the kingdom or part of that kingdom, at least in any meaningful way. So that's why when Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's saying, you know, you, you know, repent of this own kingdom and that other rule that you have there and come under the authority, come under the rulership of God himself as he manifests his power into the world. And so, the kingdom of God is the rule of God as is displayed in our world. We see it in Jesus, and we see it through what Jesus did, right? It's his rule on display around us. We, we see it when people profess faith in Christ, when they repent and they obey his word. That's why it's a, a covenant relationship that they are called to believe in Jesus Christ, and as they believe in him, they, they, they come under his authority, but they enter into his promises. And so there's this saving relationship that's built and a call to a new way of life. If you look at Mark chapter one, I have a number of passages here. We we'll, might jump around, so if you get your fingers stretched out and you, know, you get ready to jump around a few passages, I mean, sure, you could live at, look at the screen, but it's more fun to look around your Bible, but... Um, so, and you can make notes in your Bible. You can't make notes on the screen. But anyways. All right, so Mark chapter one, verses 14 and 15. Uh, Jesus adds something to this. Uh, you know, Mark records a little bit different um, statement of Jesus. Um, it, it fills it out a little bit. Uh, Mark 1, 14, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. A couple things we see there. The time is fulfilled, right? In other words, the waiting time is done. Now it's here. Repent and believe the gospel. So we see Jesus adding, you know, in Mark as he records this, you know, a, a, another component of entering the kingdom of God is this, the necessity of faith. Well, let me just ask you, as you are here today, have you believed the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you believed Jesus, that he died for your sins on the cross, he resurrected from the dead so that you could have eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. I mean, that's what it means to have eternal life. It's the gospel which brings us into God's kingdom. Well, if you look over to Colossians, flipping over a few books um, to the right, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, uh, it speaks about the sovereignty of God in our salvation. Colossians, where are you? There you are. Colossians 1.13, it talks about the, the, the sovereignty of God in bringing us out of one kingdom and then bringing us into another. And in this we say, God, thank you for saving me. God, if, if you know Christ, if you know salvation, this is the time to say thank you. Uh, verse 13, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You know, praise God that he would take us out of a dominion of darkness under that rule, under that authority, and bring us into a kingdom of light, the kingdom of his son. What joy. You know, we have the assurance as we profess faith in Christ 
because we're part of his body, we have the assurance that we're part of his kingdom. While the church is not the kingdom in its entirety, the Bible talks about the church as if it's the gateway to the kingdom. It talks about it as if it's the vanguard of the kingdom of God or the, or the front line of this kingdom of heaven. As a person becomes part of the church through the profession of faith in Christ, he or she enters this kingdom. Now, what does this kingdom look like? What's his character? Romans. Turn over to Romans. Romans 14, 17. Romans 14, 17. And the character of the kingdom matters. I mean, like, what is it that we're talking about? What do we talk about the rule of God? What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, Romans 14, 17 gives us what it is, what it isn't. Uh, uh, Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but it's a, but of righteousness and peace and the joy in the Holy Spirit. You know, so it's written, this is written to show us it's not about self-expression or just self-fulfillment. It's not about primarily about self-esteem. That's what he's getting to when he says it's not a matter of eating and drinking and expressing the, all the freedoms that you could possibly have in the world. It's not about finding yourself, indulging every personal interest. But he says instead it's a matter of righteousness and joy and peace. Righteousness, to be made right with God. And then, and then coming, being made right with God, we're working to walk right with God. We're working to walk right, walk right with God in the world that we are. It's also about peace, that insofar it is our ability to do so, is that we are making peace. That we live in peace with God, that we live in peace with our brothers, and that we work to make peace between men. And we also see joy. That there is something which is a part of the Christian life which, which uh, you know, results in, in, in a satisfaction and a contentment with life. You know, that's the character of what we're going to see. And that's the character of what we want to see. You know, that which is right, that which brings peace, that which brings joy into our world. And so the kingdom is present where people work out their faith. Does it work out in good works? Doing what's right even when it's inconvenient? Doing work for God's glory? where there's mercy, where there's care for others in Jesus' name, where we build up others in Christ. It's here when we worship, when we give uh, to, generously to the needs of God's people or God's kingdom. Um, those all show the rule of God in our lives and through our actions. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 10, I want to jump back a little bit and just to show a couple things of how we know that Jesus is bringing the kingdom. We already saw in Mark that he says that the, that the time is fulfilled. Well, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 7, uh, Jesus is talking with his disciples. He's sending them out to do work of evangelism, to go make um, his work known. And, and it's interesting what he says. In verse 7, he says, and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? Then Matthew 10, 8 What's his next instruction? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. His point in saying this is this, is that people are going to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand and we're going to prove that God's rule has, has, has appeared in our world. And we're going to show God's rule in these things. Amen. Healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, and casting out demons. God is more powerful than sickness. God is even more powerful than death. God is more powerful than the demons. Every time one of these things would happen, they would see God's rule manifested right before them. These things are done in Jesus' name, showing that indeed the kingdom had come. And as every one of those um, miracles is done, the kingdom is proclaimed. It's not only are they saying, hey, look, God's rule is demonstrated right here. But the follow-up is, you need to come under God's rule. As you see, God's mighty works recognize that he has sovereign authority over all of us and all the world. Come under that rule. Come into his kingdom. Turn over to Matthew 12. Just turn over a couple pages. Matthew 12, 12, 28. Because here we see Jesus driving out demons. It's really interesting what he says about the kingdom of God as he talks about driving out demons. And he's explaining himself, defending himself um, in some of his work. And he says, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, and it was, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You see what he's saying here? It's already here. I just showed it to you every time I drove out a demon. I just showed it to you in the work that, 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 that I was doing. Now the most ultimate miracle which shows the kingdom of God has come is the resurrection of Jesus. 
the ultimate miracle to show that God's rule over all things has been seen in Jesus. He defeated death. He defeated sin when Jesus rose from the dead. Believe in him. It's the ultimate sign of God's authority for us to follow. Attesting to the truth of God's word. So here we see uh, this is you know, the kingdom of God. It's in Jesus Christ. And as we're in Jesus Christ, we enter in a relationship with God. And, and that and God rules us even as he blesses us with his promises. Right? And we see the goodness of his rule. We see the goodness of his law. And we see the goodness of his life where his power is demonstrated. All right. One thing we want to look at when we talk about the kingdom is also the future kingdom. That's our second point. The kingdom is a present reality, right? Jesus brought it, but there's also a future glory that we don't quite see right now, right? We're part of his kingdom, even as we believe, but there's still something to come. And if you want to look at that, look at Revelation. I have two verses in the book of Revelation. That one's easy to find if you have a hard time finding things in your Bible because it's at the end. All right, Re Revelation chapter 11 Verse 15, and it's interesting to, you know, it's a picture of what's to come. It's a picture of a glory that's later to be manifested, to be displayed and revealed to the earth. Verse 15, the seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You know, what do we see there? We see God's rule coming into the earth, coming over the earth, that this kingdom of God, which is still um, somewhat hidden, which, is, which reveals itself time and again in, in, in the working of God in our world, but here it just comes and it takes over the whole thing. Right? The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Christ. And now the question is, what does that look like? We'll turn over to Revelation 21. What does that kingdom look like? And I just love this passage. Revelation 21 we read about the new heavens and the new earth. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. No more sin. No more death. No more evil. That's the kingdom of our God. As he takes over the kingdom of the world. You know, it's a, it's, as wonderful of a vision it is to see, it's helpful for us to understand now. Because right now we live in a world where God's rule is incomplete. We still see sickness, we still see death, we still see war, and we still see suffering. You know, things that are contrary to God's rule, against his rule. And he demolishes those things in time, in his time. We long to see when that happens. Come, Lord Jesus. That's our prayer. It shows us a lot when we deal with problems in the church. Because we talk about the kingdom of God and people coming under the rule of God, we'd love to imagine that everybody who's a part of the church um, is always kind and loving and joyful. But we know that there are people who say they're a part of God's kingdom, but they have not submitted to God's rule. A person can be a member inside of a church, but not be part of God's kingdom. They just haven't submitted and surrendered to God's rule. Don't let that be true of you. It's a warning that we give week in, week out. And as we look in Jesus' parables, you see, there's time and again. People think they're part of this kingdom, but they're not. Be sure that your faith is in Christ. You've repented of your sins and you've trusted in him. On the other side, we all recognize that there are parts of our lives which are not uh, submitted under the rule of God as they should be. There are areas of growth for every one of us. And we'll see it in others as well. Things not submitted to God, but yet the genuine faith is there. As God is patient with us, we're called to be patient with others as well. We hope that life would always be uplifting. We're disappointed by people we thought we could count on. We see poor behavior in others. We see unbelief. The reminder of the future kingdom gives us hope that God will restore things rightly. It gives us patience that things right now are not as they will be. And it tempers our expectation of forgiveness and patience. These things are not wholly unexpected. All right, so we've seen you know, this 
the appearance, the revelation of God's kingdom in Jesus. We see what the kingdom will be. I want to talk a little bit about like what it means for us in the middle of those two things. Like we've come into this, but we're waiting for its consummation. Well, how is it that we live it now in light of it? That's my third point. Uh, The kingdom is revealed. This is my third point. The kingdom is revealed now through the lives of God's people acting faithfully. It's revealed through the lives of God's people acting faithfully. Romans 14, 17. Remember we said the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We live out the kingdom as we do the ordinary life of the church. And that's true. In the preaching of God's word, in our worship, in our evangelism, in our mercy, caring for one another, loving one another in Christ. Remember, the church is the vanguard of the kingdom. And that's part of it. We talk about that a lot. So I want to consider things that are outside and how we you know, manifest the kingdom when we live lives in the world. Remember that as they healed the sick, they drove out demons, they raised the dead, that was, they were declaring the kingdom of God is at hand. And as we do our work out in the world, in Jesus' name, showing God's rules, we're able to show, hey, the kingdom of God has come. Look, in, look to Jesus, believe in him. And I was reading, you know, as part of my study, one of the commentaries I read was by, is by Daniel Doriani, and it's his commentary on Matthew. And I thought it, the section he had was such a good example, I wanted to share it. It's pretty long, but it's a pretty long example. But it gives like one good example of what it could mean to show God's rule inside of our life. Now, you need to work it through in your own work life. You need to work it through in your own family life, in your own community life, whatever. Uh, but I, I think his example is good. And he does it by talking about a doctor and, and um, how a doctor who has Christian conviction wants to show the rule of God might display that inside of their own practice. And the doctor he's talking about is a doctor who has Christian conviction to, you know, and, and pro-life conviction. And he wants to demonstrate that Christian pro-life conviction inside of his medical practice. And so he's an obstetrician, that means a baby doctor, um, you know, baby in the womb doctor. And, um, and so he's caring for mothers um, to be and the babies that are in them. And so, um, so he wants to work out his pro-life convictions within the fabric of his practice in several ways. And so this is what Doriani writes. He says, although his offices are in a prosperous part of an economically robust city, about 20% of his expectant mothers are unmarried, and another 20% of the pregnancies are unplanned. As a result, abortion is on the mind of many patients. He is always ready to tell his patients that abortion is wrong, but he integrates pro-life principles into every facet of his practice. First, the doctor uses pro-life language. News of a pregnancy is delivered to the expectant mother in this way. Congratulations, you're going to have a baby. At all points, the staff labels the growing life as a baby. It's not a fetus. The doctor says, this is your baby's heartbeat, or this sonogram is a picture of your baby. Second, the doctor gives pro-life counsel. If a patient is contemplating abortion aloud, the doctor is forthright. He says, it is true that every woman has a decision, but you made your decision when you conceived this child. Now your baby is living and growing inside of you. If a mother says she cannot care for a baby, he proposes adoption since for an adoption counselor. Third, the doctor uses pro-life economics. If a woman says, I can't afford to have a baby, someone explains how the cost of a childbirth can be covered by insurance, by the state, or as a last resort, by his practice. If necessary, the doctor makes a plan to waive all fees to protect an unborn child. So in these ways, the Christian physician waves kingdom, weaves, he weaves Christian principles into his practice. And that sort of example shows that God's children never put their faith on a shelf. It shows how we can think through our own work in light of God's kingdom. It shows how God's kingdom means that God's rule should permeate all that we do. So again, I don't know how this affects how doctors do their work, or even some of these things may not be allowed in Virginia. I don't know all those rules. But, you know, the point is just an example of just working through how we can carry out Christian conviction in our own workplace. How do we do that? Doriani, though, tells a personal, about a personal incident that happened to him, which kind of, which contrasts with um, this doctor here. And it's a story of a time that he and his wife had a miscarriage, um, or his wife had a miscarriage. And so they both suffered the loss of this, this baby. Um, his wife's regular doctor was very much pro-life, and his wife's regular doctor incorporated pro-life principles into his practice. But unfortunately, when the miscarriage happened, her regular 
obstetrician was out of town and the doctor who covered for him showed indifference or personal loss and the doctor made the grief worse. The doctor referred to the life that had perished in the womb as tissue and a quote, product of conception. He said, your wife is experiencing pain because there is still some tissue in there that we need to remove. I'll spare some of the other gory details, but Doriani, who was horrified, he had to control everything in himself not to shout, that's not tissue, that's my baby. Later, Doriani, he told um, a member of his own church who also was a surgeon, and he told him about the experience, and he told the man, based on the way that that doctor acted, um, or he behaved, I'm surprised that my doctor uses him as a backup when he's gone. He spoke and he acted as if uh, no life was lost, and I have to assume he performs abortions. And so the surgeon, his friend, he inquired, he said, what was the doctor's name? When he told him the name, the doctor was surprised and said, oh, I know him, and he is very pro-life. He would never perform an abortion. So Doriani, in the the comments, he says this, how sad then that he did not let his pro-life values permeate his language and his treatment of his patients. He goes on to conclude, the contrast between the conduct of these two obstetricians speaks to us all. If we know God is king and we submit to his rule, then we should want that commitment to permeate every aspect of life. There's another story of Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was one of the world's, uh, uh, the church's first theologians. He lived around AD 150, so 120 years after Jesus had lived. And, and he talks about a certain wooden plow that was designed by uh, Jesus and his father in their wood shop as carpenters. You know, it's 120 years, you know, this is a wooden plow, you know, and, um, you know, I mean, if it's, if it's accurate, you know, we could see, you know, the great handiwork in the thing that he did. I mean, it's a demonstration of God's rule in the world to do work excellently. Martin Luther once said, even the milkmaid can tend her cows to the glory of God. And so that's our prayer, that God would um, use our work to display his rule, to display how he's, to display accurately how he's created the world, how he's designed it to run. One of the places that God's kingdom especially shows up um, is in the way that we relate with others. And I don't have time, so much time to go through this right now, but um, in Matthew, the book of Matthew, in verse, starting in chapter 5, we'll see this very soon, we see the Beatitudes. You know, what's the character of somebody who's a part of God's kingdom? And we see a lot of qualities in Matthew 5, 3 through 9, and, you know, qualities of, of humility, of meekness, of forgiveness, of patience with others, you know, the qualities of, of hungering after God and his kingdom. And such a difference to, the, to, to the, what the world is. The world is unforgiving. The world is rude. The world is proud and greedy and violent. And it doesn't value relationships. It doesn't value people. And as Jesus is going to go through the, the nature of the kingdom as he moves forward, you know, as it means coming under God's rule, it means we have a much different way that we interact with people inside, especially within the body of Christ, but even out in the world. It's a way that we glorify God. So we're going to come to the Lord's Supper in a minute. So let me just conclude. As we just think through, you know, this kingdom of God, this idea of the kingdom of God, you know, the first thing we see is we come into the kingdom of God through repentance of sin and belief in Jesus. You know, and just to ask you again, have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you entered into his kingdom? He's, he died for sinners on the cross. He resurrected from the dead. Have you put your trust in him that you would know that your sins are forgiven and that you're a part of his kingdom? You know, don't delay in making Christ your Savior and repenting and believing in him. And the second thing is, again, to consider, how would his kingdom display itself through your life? You know, how does it show up in your family? You know, do you display kingdom principles in the way that you care for each other and, and build up one another in Christ? How does it show up in your workplace? You know, can you see God's rule in the, way, in the work that you do and you're able to display it by doing what you do to God's honor and glory? You know, how does it show up in our community as we think through the way that we vote and the way that we um, interact with um, neighborhood associations as we care for those who are needy inside of our area? You know, can we see the rule of God and the way it's displayed? Let's pray that the Lord would help us to do that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you have made a way to your kingdom by faith in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, he's that way. We're united to him by faith. 
as your church. Father, that's the gateway. That's the way we go in, by becoming the part of his body by faith. So we thank you, God, for doing that. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you've converted our hearts. Father, you brought us to repentance, that you've given us faith. God, we give thanks for those things. And now that we're here, Father, help us to live that out in our workplace, in showing mercy, God, in uh, the way that we interact with one another, by a love of your law and obedience to, to your commands. Father, help us to do it as a church together. Father, we'd see um, your kingdom to be worked out and displayed even here in the way that we honor you and glorify you in the way that we relate as your body together to bring glory to your name. And so, Lord, we ask for your grace to help us to do any of these things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well.